journalist working um, at a newspaper called Ultima Hora uh, uh, during the time of the most recent military dictatorship uh, that began in 1964 and ended in 1985. And he composed the novel during um, one of the most repressive periods uh, of that dictatorship. Um, and, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about things like that. But in, in very general terms, the novel follows the main character, a man named Jose Gonsalves, um, who is sort of a low life or a trashy guy. Uh, and it follows part of his adult life as he lives in a city that Brandão calls Sao Maulu, a very thinly disguised version of Sao Paulo, in an unnamed country <laughs> in a place called America Latindia, uh, you know, another. Um, <laughs> obviously a very thinly disguised version of Latin America. Um, and the novel was censored, no big surprise, but ostensibly not because it was political or subversive, but simply for moral grounds, which was uh, the typical line that the, the censors gave for um, banning books during, during the military dictatorship. It is a very political novel, and it's pretty obvious reading it that it's dealing with themes um, very relevant to the time period in Brazil, uh, themes of censorship, repression, marginalization, um, the, the uh, brutal response of the government and the military toward um, any type of urban guerrilla movement or rural guerrilla movement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's full of trash, uh, as you'll see. So I'll begin. Trash is a fact of life. While all organisms isolate and expel waste, toxins, or other material that is harmful or simply no longer useful to them, human beings have seemingly managed to far outstrip other organisms in the production of trash via the dialectic of usefulness versus waste. Highly accelerated rates of production and consumption in this, the era of late capitalism, have created a scenario in which the problem of refuse cannot be seen as one of individuals simply isolating and expelling the waste materials that they produce. Rather, the production of trash has taken on an industrial scale, the contours of which we might be able to delimit by considering the capacity of social organisms for producing and dealing with waste. While the production of trash by social organisms has everything to do with material objects that are used and discarded, it is essential not to overlook the discursive procedures that are part and parcel of human interactions with the material world. The way that we use the concept of trash to parse out both the material and non-material into categories of value, like useful versus useless, valuable versus discardable, permanent versus transient, is evinced by a simple dictionary search for the word trash. The first entry establishes the material parameters of the term, discarded matter or refuse, while the second and third entries seem to extend that material framework to the realm of cultural artifacts and human beings, respectively. On the one hand, cultural items, ideas, or objects of poor quality, and on the other, a person or people regarded as being of very low social standing. Thus, via the metaphoric quality that language constantly exhibits, both ideas and people come to be thought of and discussed in terms of refuse. It is this intersection between the material and the discursive that interests me here. More specifically, the matter that I would like to examine now is how the production of trash is inscribed discursively into Ignacio G. Loyola Brandão's 1974 novel, Zero Romance Prehistorico. Today, I will propose that trash is a fundamental compositional and thematic element in the text, and I will divide my argument into three main sections. In the first section, we will see that the novel itself can be read as an assortment of elements that the Brazilian military dictatorship of 64 to 85 attempted to dispose of, that is, as trash, but that Brandão rescued by virtue of creating a novel out of them. In the second section, I'll enter directly into the text in order to analyze the metonymical procedure deployed by Brandão that puts human beings and trash in relation to each other in the novel, thus laying bare a brutal logic that reduces people to bare life, a zone of indistinction in which sovereign power enacts extreme violence on its subjects with impunity. In the third and final section, I'll turn to a few key instances in the novel that foreground the fact that the production of material, discursive, and human trash creates a necessity for garbage dumps. While such dumps constitute an attempt to isolate and neutralize the threat posed by trash, they ultimately serve as the grounds from which the state of emergency that brought them about can be narrated. Now, before moving on to Zeru, I'll mention briefly um, the theoretical grounding that I'm, uh, the, some of the theoretical grounding for what I'm calling the production of trash. To that effect, uh, in part, I turn to Julia Kristeva's theorization of the abject in her essay, Powers of Horror, in which she analyzes the place of abjection in the process of identity formation. In my view, trash, like Kristeva's abject, isn't simply some external object that we find repulsive because it's filthy. Instead, it straddles the border between self and other, it repels and, and attracts by the same measure, and it provides the grounds from which to critically examine the acts of disposal that turn objects, discourses, and people into trash. 
By considering the production of trash within the framework that Kristeva provides, we can see that trash is brought into existence by an operation of exclusion or separation. It is produced by the subject, whether that subject be individual or collective, and jettisoned, but it never ceases to be present. This presence constantly threatens to undo the operation of separation that the subject performed in order to constitute itself. And Kristeva reminds us that, and I quote, from its place of banishment, the abject does not cease challenging its master, end quote. In spite of, and perhaps because of, the Brazilian military, military dictatorship's systematic efforts to reduce internal opposition to the status of trash and to banish it from the confines of the nation and its imaginary, a trace of that opposition inevitably remained. Such is the process of inclusive exclusion at, the, at work in the production of trash during the Brazilian military regime, a process that Brandão transposes into the fiction that is Zeru. Thinking about how that trash is produced and dealt with, not simply in terms of material waste to be discarded, but rather along the lines of the object with its capacity to disrupt subjectivity, allows us to see how that trash, that jettisoned object, emerges as a potent force of contestation. Ultimately, the challenge with which the abject confronts its master is what Brandau salvages in his novel. And this brings me to the essay's first section, which I call Zeru, a novel made out of trash. When the Brazilian military took over the government on March 31, 1964, Brandau, a journalist, was working for Ultima Hora, a center-left newspaper that had been founded upon Getulio Vargas's return to power in 1951, and that, from its inception, prided itself on being, in the words of Brandau in an essay where he talks about the, the genesis of his novel, on, on the side of the Brazilian worker, a political alignment that garnered the newspaper immediate attention from the military regime's censors. Brandel, who worked in the newsroom as the paper's secretario, had the task of receiving stories from different desks and choosing which ones to run in a given edition before handing the stories over to the layout team. Once the layout was complete, it would be passed along to the censor, who would accept or ban individual stories. The censored stories and images were physically clipped from the layout, and Brandau began collecting them in a pile on the table next to his desk from the very first day that the censor worked in the newsroom. One day, the censored clippings happened to spill onto the floor, and a janitor who was passing by asked if Brandau wanted the clippings thrown into the trash. After hesitating for a moment, Brandau decided to save the clippings, and soon thereafter, he began accumulating all sorts of news stories, both banned and approved, and this material eventually became the novel Zeru. In telling this story, Brandau repeatedly emphasizes the non-fictional nature of the episodes that are contained in the novel. Thus, he asserts that his novel, uh, in both its content and fragmented structure, is a reproduction of the fragmentary, violent, chaotic social reality of Brazilian society in the late 1960s under the military regime. Brandau's account of the genesis and composition of his novel is a suggestive point of departure for reading Zeru as a novel that is, in fact, made out of trash. Now, at first blush, reading the fact that the janitor at the newspaper identified the clippings that Brandau had inadvertently knocked to the floor as trash as an indication that the novel that those clippings gave rise to is made out of trash may seem a bit simplistic or literal-minded. I would submit, however, that lurking behind the janitor's innocent turn of phrase is the fact that images and stories that Brandau had been accumulating were bits of information and discourse that the dictatorship had jettisoned through the act of censorship in an attempt to banish and destroy them. Moreover, Zeru's accumulation of items that the regime considered to be abject is not limited to the way in which the materials that gave rise to the novel were gathered. That Zeru is composed of trash is evident in the way that the novel is overrun by trash, both thematically and discursively. In this way, I would propose that Zeru is itself a sort of garbage dump. Not only does it thematize trash through its focus on the marginal, waste products, and other forms of junk, but the novel is also rife with discursive forms of garbage, like cliches from haphazardly imported forms of entertainment oriented toward the masses, like film and television, and the language of marketing and conspicuous consumption. In the interest of time, I'll forego a detailed analysis of, of some of the more pertinent ex examples of these facets of the text, but I'd be happy, happy to go into them at more length during the question and answer period. Regarding Zeru as a text made out of trash, a garbage dump where Brandau collects not only bits of news and information cast off by the dictatorship, but also disposable, discursive elements collected from various cultural products, helps bring into focus the challenge that the novel presents to its master to return to Kristeva's turn of phrase. If, as Idelbert Avelar has argued, one of the Brazilian military dictatorship's lasting legacies is the transition from a modern national state to a transnational post-state market, but Andau's parodic appropriation of such a transnational post-state market's discursive and cultural strategies can be seen as an early example of resistance in the face of throwaway consumer culture. Moreover, the thematic and discursive inscription of trash into the text, 
sets the stage for the production of its characters as trash, abjects, not subjects, of a regime that does not hesitate to discard them, a matter to which I turn in the essay's second section, people as trash in Zeru. In her wide-ranging study of Zeru, critic Tania Pellegrini identifies Boquerão, a neighborhood full of human oddities in Brandao's fictional Sao Maulu, as a figuration of the misery that serves as, as a counterpoint to the rampant consumerism inscribed in the novel's discourse. For Pellegrini, the normalization of human misery is one of the conditions of possibility of the repressive, consumer-oriented consumer -oriented society depicted in the novel. She suggests that the marginalized inhabitants of Boquerão are reduced to the level of refuse, but perhaps due to the breadth of her study of Zeru, she does not examine exactly how the transformation from human to trash is brought about in the novel. Consequently, in what follows, I want to take Pellegrini's suggestion as a point of departure for an analysis of how human subjects are rendered as abject, expendable material in Zeru. On a rhetorical level, Brandao turns to metonymy, a figure whose logic is based on proximity or continuity, to set into motion a process whereby the novel's characters come to be seen as trash. This metonymical procedure works in two different ways in the text. First, Brandao establishes a discursive proximity between people and trash. In other words, he places descriptions of people right next to descriptions of trash, which suggests a metonymic relation between the two. A clear example of this occurs when José, the main character, is walking through the streets, ogling a girl in a miniskirt, and he suddenly starts thinking about the kinds of people he sees as he moves about the city every day. And the reader is confronted with a lengthy enumeration of the types of marginalized, infirm human beings that inhabit the city. This is followed immediately in the same narrative fragment by the description of a junkyard full of broken and abandoned vehicles that seem to exhibit similar defects to the people that José has just listed. The contiguity of these two descriptions creates a forceful association. We read about people one moment and cars the next. In both cases, they are simply deformed, useless objects, a fact that is underscored by the abrupt transition between the two descriptions. The second way in which Brandao creates a meta metonymical association between people and trash is by placing characters in the novel in, physical, in close physical proximity with refuse. This type of operation is present from the novel's very beginning, when José's job as a matahatus, uh, a rat exterminator, in a third-rate movie theater is described. He exterminates rats in the theater, collects the dead bodies in a sack, and dumps them in a vacant lot. His job is to produce and dispose of garbage, and this connection with refuse seems to be a sort of contagion that follows him throughout the rest of the novel. The association that, that arises between people and trash due to a physical proximity with refuse is not limited, however, to José. In fact, it reaches its height in a series of fragments entitled Lar, and in the English translation, that, those sections are called Home Sweet Home, found toward the end of the novel. The, the first fragment reads as follows. Pais e filhos disputando o lixo a imundice, o resto da sujeira da cidade colocado em montes imensos, coisas podres, urubus, gente catando, separando, selecionando, o cheiro deteriorado. The other four fragments in the series give brief glimpses of murder, rape, illness, vengeance, in short, the disposable nature of the lives of those who live around this trash dump. The almost constant association of people, particularly grotesque and marginalized people, with trash in Zeru via a metonymic procedure that manifests itself both at the level of the novel's construction and its development of characters, creates a textual economy in which the body is rendered as expendable material that can be disposed of easily. If this is the case, a few questions are in order. First, who is it that exerts power over these expendable bodies? And second, what is at stake in an artistic representation of such a gruesome scenario? It seems to me that just as the, it is the authoritarian state that dismantles and disposes of Boquerão in the novel, the power that decides which bodies are expendable and what to do with them is sovereign power. The relationship between power and physical vulnerability present in Zeru opens the text up to a biopolitical reading. For what is biopolitics if not the interaction of sovereign power and the natural physical life of human beings? By examining Zeru's foregrounding of the biopolitical, it becomes evident that what is at stake in the production of trash in the novel is a thorough examination of the mechanisms by which the state of exception exposes bodies to extreme forms of violence that are not an aberration, but rather part and parcel of, any, any, of the logic of any state of exception, like the Brazilian military regime. In the longer version of this project, I, I undertake a detailed reading of the novel's main character, José Gonçalves, through the lens of Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben's theorization of the figure of Homo Sacer, the sacred man, whose relationship to sovereign power is constituted via a series of exclusions that place him in a zone of indistinction that Agamben calls the zone of bare life, which exposes people's bodies to brutal forms of violence and degradation. 
Examining the parallels between the homo sacer and the way that José is constituted as a character shows ultimately how sovereign power is trans how the sovereign power transposed into Brandau's fiction is one that reduces the lives of its citizens to bare life and subsequently to objects that can be discarded like trash. And this leads me to the essay's final section, the dumping grounds of America La Chindia. As I've argued, discursive material and human trash pervades Zeru. But this analysis of the production of trash inscribed in Brandau's novel would be incomplete without considering how the need for dumping grounds that any production of trash entails is registered in the text. We've already seen evidence of such dumping grounds in the foregoing discussion. At the novel's outset, for instance, José improvises a dump in an abandoned lot for the rats he, extermin he exterminates in a movie theater. Likewise, as I've contended, the text itself can be seen as a garbage dump that collects both the castoffs of the dictatorship and degraded discursive and narrative elements salvaged from imported popular culture. Now I would like to turn to two other instances of dumping grounds in Zeru in order to consider two important aspects of the notion of the garbage dump. First, how it fits into a discussion of the center-periphery dynamics of the international market, and second, how it serves as a site from which to contest the brutality of a regime that reduces human life to garbage. The first fragment of the series called Lar, that I just a bit ago discussed in terms of the association that arises between trash and people due to a physical proximity between the two, consists of a brief, somewhat chaotic description of a garbage dump where, fam where families of trash pickers fight with vultures over the putrid leftovers of the city of Sao Malu. José and his wife Jose, at a later point in these fragments, um, find themselves visiting a family in one of these ramshackle dwellings near the dump, and the setting is described as follows. A porta fechada corrente cadeado. Eles deram a volta, outra porta nos fundos, fechada corrente cadeado. Pedras, folhas, papéis, garrafas, paus, resto de comida. Um cachorro sarmento amarrado corrente. Um varal, sacos de estopa pendurados, calça ali lavada, duas meias de cores diferentes, o barraco na ponta de uma elevação. 200 metros abaixo, o mato, o rio, fábricas em construção, Fábricas prontas construindo coisas para o povo comprar chaminés. Catching view of factories ready to churn out products for people to buy from the vantage point of a garbage dump and its surrounding squalor opens up a space of critical reflection on the effect that the transition to a post-state transnational market economy has had on Brazil, a transition that marshals the concept of the superiority of so-called first world technological innovations in modes of production in order to create a discourse of power in which the center continues to dictate the parameters of progress for the periphery. Peruvian critic Daniel Castillo Durante has analyzed the center-periphery relationships in which Latin American countries are engaged in terms of garbage disposal. In this dynamic, the center performs what he calls a basurización, or garbageification, of the periphery, whereby the center's exportation of material, symbolic, and discursive goods to the Latin American periphery can be interpreted as one of the ways in which the center disposes of its garbage, thus consti constituting Latin America as a rubbish heap. He adds, and I quote, it can be said that the objective of the market is not so much consumption as disposal, to which might be added that disposal constitutes the very condition of possibility for consumption. Since everything may be thrown away, discarded, and, and disposed of, only a frenetic consumption could create the illusion of continuity to the cycle of production. The figure of the garbage dump as it is deployed in zero, in Zeru, underscores the, sorry, end quote, then, the, the figure of the garbage dump as, as it is deployed in Zeru underscores the centrality of disposal to societies organized around consumption. The lar, or home, that this economic scenario gives rise to is one of abjection and marginalization filled with trash. By way of conclusion, I would like to examine one more garbage dump that appears in Zeru, one which serves as the place where the dictatorial regime gathers the bodies of the people it is liquidated. There are a few fragments in the novel that make mention of a berço esplendido, a splendid cradle that obviously recalls the Brazilian national anthem. The first tells a story about a remote place in America La Chindia where vegetation from across the continent grew and, and that was the site where thousands of years ago, as the novel tells it, the single people that eventually gave rise to all the peoples of the Americas established their civilization. After some time, the site was abandoned, but the military regime eventually found a use for it. Para essa região, as milícias levavam os ladrões, assassinos subversivos, terroristas, guerrilheiros. Abandonados lá, naquela extensão da, de terras da América, milhares de pessoas estavam enterradas. Os que sabiam porque tinham morrido e os que não sabiam. Os que tinham morrido por alguma coisa sabiam que estavam no berço do continente miserável, arrebentado, espezinhado, estraçalhado. 
This verso esplendido returns, returns toward the end of the novel when José's friend Achila, who has been jailed and tortured by the novel's military regime, travels by airplane with about 200 other prisoners to the Corazón de América, the heart of America. A few pages later, Achila is dead and buried in the verso esplendido, but even in death he maintains his senses and some form of consciousness. Achila apodrecia. Estava se decompondo e sentia o cheiro terrulento da própria descomposição. Sua carne devastada por uma encho, decepada, estraçalhada, retalhada, de tal modo insuportável que Atila queria gritar. Sua voz não existia. Atila, along with all the others buried in this mass grave, this human garbage dump, has been reduced to mere detritus. Like any piece of trash in a landfill, his presence beneath the ground goes unnoticed as he dissolves into the mass of dead bodies around him. But, like Cristeva's abject, Achila straddles the supposed boundary between life and death. He is dead and rotting, but he maintains his senses and is conscious of the fact that he is rotting. This consciousness that is neither alive nor dead is a force with the potential to disrupt the seemingly seamless nature of the sovereign power that put him into such a state. But Achila, we read, has no voice with which to denounce those who have reduced him to refuse. The operation of separation and exclusion of the abject seems to have neutralized it. Kristeva reminds us that the abject does not cease challenging its master, but how can this be accomplished if the figure of the abject has no voice with which to issue a challenge? In the end, I think that the task undertaken by Brandao in Zeru is that of creating a textual space from which to pose this challenge. By rescuing the detritus cast off by the military dictatorship, laying bare the process by which the state of exception reduces people to trash, and contemplating all of these horrors from the space of the garbage dump, Zedu adheres to the tradition of the oppressed that Walter Benjamin wrote about when he said, and I quote, the tradition of the oppressed teach us, teaches us that the state of emergency in which we live is not the exception, but the rule. We must, attain, we must attain to a conception of history that is in keeping with this insight. Then we shall clearly realize that it is our task to bring about a real state of emergency, end quote. Perhaps the sad, beleaguered cry of Deus salvia America, God save America, with which the novel ends is a plea for just such a state of emergency. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions, if, uh, if you have them, for both presenters. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, not a question, just a comment. Your topic and the delivery reminded me of the end of uh, the famous uh, novel, Lobo Sobirados. Where the, the, the male uh, protagonist is 14 years old. Mm -hmm. After he's murdered, his parents find him and throw him into a car mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating. There's, uh, at least in, in my field of study in, in contemporary Latin American literature, this idea of the association between sovereign power and its reduction of, of people to what Agamben calls their fair life turns them into trash, and uh, the, the novels are, are really able to, to make that connection very explicit in a way that, um, that uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily see uh, from other types of cultural production. Thanks for the comment. The ice has been broken. <laughs> I guess if no, look that, yes, please. Uh, just a comment, I guess, to the last uh, presentation. Uh, it doesn't have uh, that much to do with the novel itself, but with your framing of the invitation. Uh, you invoke the center periphery uh, and the dependency theory in the perspective. Uh, but I wonder, you know, I mean, I think, you know, that's is a generally acceptable way of looking at it. Relations, but what about internally? I mean, does the novel convey any sense of uh, class divisions, class struggle? Uh, what classes do the military represent? You know, who from the internal classes, who are the ones that are being trashed and so on and so forth? I, that, that's a, a very good question. I think um, the the critic that I that I mentioned with regard to garbage vacation, uh, he, he has a, a few things to say about how with these center periphery um, relations that get set up, uh, it, it's a chain of relations. And so there is a center and a periphery within the periphery. And then it, 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 you know, sort of keeps going 
like that. I, I think that's pretty evident in, in the novel as well. Um, I don't know that there's a really clear picture in the novel of um, who the military is, uh, because the novel really focuses more on the perspective of, of uh, those who are marginalized. But uh, one, one thing that I didn't get into um, too much in, in this version of the paper is that I, I mentioned a few times this neighborhood or area called Boca Out, um, which is uh, takes up a, a decent amount of the novel, and it's uh, this sort of place that just arises out of uh, not really a landfill, but just sort of like a wasteland um, somewhere in the urban area. And Jose, the main character, um, ends up working in this area as a recruiter of uh, freaks, of marginalized people, infirm people, uh, people who are, are just different from the consumer society that is also represented um, in, in the novel. And these are the type of people that uh, later on in the novel, the military regime comes in and clears them out in a very similar way to um, like what RJ is talking about with the purification uh, of the favelas. And, and so the, I think there's definitely um, a hint of, of a strong class element there. Yes, uh, novel in your frame, I'm wondering, have you looked at that trash that comes back, that, that, that we 